Good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, or wherever you are. Uh, on behalf of the Uppsala Health Summit, I want to, want to welcome you all to this launch of our post-conference uh, meeting from the big um, Uppsala Health Summit uh, event this spring on antimicrobial resistance and behavioral change or behavior. Um, my name is Ulf Mangson. I'm a professor at the uh, Swedish University of Agriculture. Uh, I'm also the chair of the um, um, program committee of the Uppsala Health Summit. Uh, the summit itself, as you might know, uh, we gather about 600 uh, people from around the world, from 72 countries. And uh, this uh, post conference. Uh, report that we are going to discuss here today uh, is the product of uh, several workshops and a lot of work from colleagues um, around the world. Um, I will just walk you through the program briefly here. Um, we will have a presentation by uh, Dr. Con Peters. He's a professor of socioeducation ecological health research unit uh, at the Institute of Tropical uh, Health and Medicine in Antwerp in Belgium. And he will describe some or discuss around case studies from Cambodia and Vietnam. Uh, I think it will be super interesting. Um, in addition to him, we have a, um, a panel of very distinguished colleagues that will discuss the very uh, report as such. It's uh, Dr. Claire Chandler. She is a professor of medical anthropology at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And she's also the director of the Antimicrobial Resistance Center uh, there. You're most welcome, Claire. Uh, and we also have Dr. Sujit Shandi. He's a professor in clinical pharmacology uh, at the Christian Medical College in Velour in, in India and a member also of the WHO Strategic and Technical Advisory Group on AMR. You're most welcome. Uh, and then we have uh, Tracy Murray. She's a policy advisor to, to REACT, and that's the Action on Antibiotic Resistance for Africa, and a program uh, officer at Ecum Ecumenical Pharmaceutical uh, Network. Uh, you're most welcome, Tracy. Uh, and this whole operation will be moderated by my dear colleagues here in Uppsala, Dr. Eva Garmendia, she's a um, project coordinator at the Uppsala Antibiotic Center, to the left, and to the right you see uh, Dr. Frederica Santoro, and she's a science communicator at the Uppsala Monitoring Center. So, uh, with these words, I, I want to uh, leave the floor to you, Con. Kun, and um, very keen to listen to, to, to your insights in, in an area where I worked, geographical area where I worked a lot myself. So the floor is yours, Kun, please. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, I hope you can all see my screen now. So I decided to limit myself to looking at the context of AMR in urban Cambodia since we're only at 12 minutes, so it's a bit shorter. I'm sorry I cannot to the Vietnamese uh, examples that'll be for another time. So what I wanted to look at today specifically is a little bit about the concept of behavioral change and what happens when we mark, like when we emphasize that a lot versus other um, paradigms, for example. And I wanted to look at this in relation to what we can call the ABC paradigm for social change. So Behavioral change, as you all know, uh, refers to the efforts put in place to change people's personal habits and attitudes to prevent a disease. And we can, in social sciences, some authors have, for example, situated that as part of what could be seen as an ABC paradigm. Now, ABC, for ABC paradigm for social change, we mean that we basically see and look at people's attitudes that are believed to drive some kinds of behavior that individuals then choose to adopt. So key elements in that sense for behavioral change or this ABC paradigm are that effective intervention should target individual behavior and that then people's actions are their personal responsibility. So in that sense, the responsibility here of responding to AMR 
lies with the individuals and the behavioral choices that they make. Now in this talk, I wanted to um, link that a little bit with looking at the systemic aspects that maybe we might not remark on when we look at behavioral change in this limited vision. Not to say that that's not important or that that's what we reduce ourselves to, but just um, as a reflection on the more systemic aspects. And I would do this looking at enteric fever in Phnom Penh in urban Cambodia. So this starts and then with the fact that in 2012 and 2015, there was a community outbreak of Salmonella paratyphi A in Phnom Penh itself, so causing enteric fever. And at that moment, various research um, groups were looking at that to see what caused the outbreak and if it had, was related with an increase of resistance uh, against ciprofloxacin. So what we did at that moment was looking at what influenced people's decision to um, prescribe or to use antibiotic in case of febrile illness. Just in um, the setting of enteric fever. Um, so first what I want to look into is a little bit of the individual decision making to then move to how this individual, this individual decision-making is um, situated in a more systemic context. Now, as some of you um, know that work in this field, health-seeking itineraries for patients that turn out to have a salmonella infection or other kind of similar febrile illnesses is quite complex in most of these countries. And in Phnom Penh, it's um, no, no different. So people start at home with home remedies, which can include coining, as you can see on the left side. And if things do not get better, they have the choice or they will choose most of the time to go for one or various pharmacies or drug outlets or to private practitioners. Now, after the private practitioners or the drug outlet, they will see whether they got better or not and then take a similar choice, maybe go to another pharmacy or drug outlet or another private practitioner. And if it's serious enough, in the end, people will end up at the hospital. So in this whole um, system, they are then always supposed to, of course, um, take responsibly a full treatment of antibiotics for cure. Now, if we analyze these um, health uh, itineraries, we see, first of all, the flexibility, right? So people will very little only have one choice of provider or treatment and be healed. Very often we go to one provider first, get one treatment first, and then see ourselves in, <coughs> sorry, what we call lay empiricism. We will check <coughs> if the treatment is effective or not. We will not do this by a professional diagnosis, but just seeing whether the patient um, recovers or does not recover. If he does not recover, we assume that the provider choice or the treatment choice was the wrong one, and we try to choose a different one. Uh, maybe because it wasn't a normal uh, disease, but it could have been a spiritual disease, or maybe the antibiotics were wrong or other types of treatments were wrong. So we do this sometimes several times. Now, one important element there is the logic of medicine use uh, and, and, uh, among the Khmer. And very often people see that when you have different symptoms of an illness, they see this as different diseases. So every um, symptoms you, you have, you require one medicine. For example, if you have a headache and diarrhea and nausea and a fever, you will try to find one medicine for each of these symptoms. Now, none, most of these symptoms very often are not diagnosed, but you will nevertheless then get a mix of these medicines, as you can see in, in the pictures, which, we, which people very often refer to as uh, cocktails or swallows in, in rural areas, and they get prescribed by pharmacies. At a picture on the bottom, you can see uh, one enteric uh, fever patient, what types of medicine this person received before getting to the hospital. Now, the contents of these bags um, vary, um, but very often include one or two or several types of antibiotics, um, vitamins, they can, depending on the disease, can have steroids or anti-inflammatory medicines. Um, if you're in a malaria endemic area at the same time, then they will include, for example, one or two anti-malarials. Um, now, if you look at the individual decision-making of the patient at community level, you can stress the importance of adherence to a full course treatment, but of course you can immediately see that this is quite difficult if you don't have uh, any uh, full course treatment prescribed. 
yeah, of the antibiotics you will take, most of the time you have only one or two of a couple of pills prescribed. You also might have economic motives not to buy a full course, but if the pharmacies prescribe a treatment, they might prescribe a mixed bag. Now for pharmacies, it's also not so easy to do the right thing if you want, because if they only prescribe one medicine or one set or strip of antibiotics, it goes a bit against sometimes the expectations people have of targeting the different symptoms. And one of the things the pharmacy always needs to do is live up in a way to patient expectations and trust, because as we will see later on, it's the only way in Cambodia um, to navigate the health system for patients. Also, these pharmacies lack diagnostic tools, for example, to detect salmonella. And very often, it's very difficult to distinguish between different types of febrile illnesses. So also the different types of medicine kind of covers all the bases. Um, a last element, again, that uh, might confuse things a little bit is that you have dual practice. So a lot of public health officials might also have a private practice and send a patient to their private practice for different types of medicine than they should or could be given in a, in a hospital, for example. Now, if you look at a hospital level, uh, navigating this health system is also not very straightforward because when we look at prescription behavior of medical doctors, they also do not necessarily base their prescriptions on laboratory tests or on specific tests that can then tell them which antibiotic is required. Um, for enteric fever, for salmonella typhi and salmonella paratyphi A, there's the Vidal test that can be used, but the results of these tests are largely ignored, and in a second we will see why. So if we look at this whole system and look a bit at the underlying systemic factors that influence whether people can behave one way or the other, the first thing to notice is that the Cambodian health system is very often uh, referred to as an emergency medical landscape. Uh, it's a um, health system that has been built up after the Khmer Rouge and has um, progressed a lot in the, in the latest decade, but still counts quite a bit of unlicensed doctors or pharmacists or other health staff, or that have received very little training, especially in rural areas, but also in some neighborhoods of the city. So both for people and other health professionals, it's not always easy to know how you deal with and what the qualifications are a, a doctor, for example, has. In addition to that, you have what people call real capacity doctors and commercial doctors. So the commercial doctors obviously are the ones that are less interested in the patient health gain, but more in financially lucrative procedures. So that's another element that um, patients have to navigate to see if they find healthcare where to go and who to listen to. Now these commercial doctors often make deals with pharmacies, shopkeepers in exchange for a percentage of the fees or make deals with laboratories, for example, or like we said before, might um, send their um, public health patients to their private practices. However, when we criticize this system, it's very important to um, keep in mind that very often this is really underpaid people that work in a health system where they cannot um, have enough of income. So they have to um, get more income. They do this maybe through commercial interest or additional uh, work. Now to come back to this um, vital test, it's very interesting to see that at a hospital, for example, um, people cannot follow these tests even when these tests are available and doctors cannot necessarily prescribe following them. Because for example, for a, a vital test, for a correct interpretation, you should have a second blood sample at least five days after the first. Now, most medical doctors that work there or other health professionals, they know that patients very likely will not come back uh, for a second checkup later on. So they have to decide at that moment, knowing that they very often will not return. An additional difficulty is, for example, that you need quite a bit of blood to do these tests, a 40 milliliter, and usually only four to five milliliter is collect, uh, collected. So it reduces the chances again of having a, a good diagnostic. Now these practice can mean lack of knowledge or very often also relate to patient demands because they do not want to give that much blood. And maybe the most surprising and difficulty I, I find for medical professionals there is their relation with laboratories. 
Now, laboratories are not often trusted by medical staff because they might lack equipment and staff or doctors might not trust the lab results because the staff is less trained or from a lower socioeconomic class. But also very often, as the quote here shows, um, labs might falsify results to show that they are a good lab. Uh, this person here says, if your lab results keep coming back negative, doctors will not send you their samples anymore. The doctor will think it's either a bad test or a bad quality lab, rather than thinking the problem is with his diagnosing. So you have a system where everybody needs to be able to survive in precarity. And so everybody wants to live up to specific expectations to be able to be part of this uh, health system and to make it function. So if we look at the patients that have to navigate the system again, um, they have very often a mistrust in the public health system because there's poor treatment, waiting lines, corruption. They don't know who to trust very often in the uh, private health care because you have all these financial gain practices and all these commercial practices to compensate for low salaries. So when they navigate this, they have to do this based on trust. And that complicates both for the patient and for the health providers, um, the interaction and what medicine they will give. So like I said already, yeah, for patients it's very difficult to adhere because of this uncertainty, because of the way they have to navigate the health system, um, because they don't receive full course treatment of antibiotics um, often, for example. Pharmacists, again, um, they don't have the diagnostic tools, they have to follow the culture and conceptions and they have to maintain the trust. So they have to give medicine to um, maintain patients' trust and for doctors, they might not rely on the labs or they cannot distinguish sometimes whether they have had genuine or fake diagnostics. Now, to sum all of this up, what I really wanted to look at is that you have had all these personal factors and the individual factors of people deciding to take a full course treatment or not, or of doctors and health staff prescribing a full course treatment or not. But the system in which they all navigate makes it very difficult for them to actually follow this. And I think a nice theoretical framework to look at this is the one of the marking of or unmarking. Um, and in this system, it says we are all part of attentional communities, right? We pay attention to specific things and we do not pay attention to other things. Uh, like this quote here of a researcher that says, when telling people that I was studying suburban gays, I was often asked if I am gay, but no one ever asked if I was suburban. So what I want this framework to use for is when we think about behavioral change, do we or not immediately think about the individual responsibility of the patient, the individual responsibility of health staff, and do we potentially like lose track of the systemic factors that pushes these people to act? Uh, do we neglect or not the structural counterpart? And this talk is just meant maybe to have this reaction when we think about these individual responsibilities, not to forget the system in which all of that is embedded. Uh, how do we research and implement those changes? And do we really expect, for example, the vulnerable individual that has to finish his or her treatment to drive the change we want? Or do we want to push for systemic factors somewhere else to drive the individual to change. Yeah? So in some, if you want to get impact, I would also like to see, or my reflection is to foreground also these structural impacts and not necessarily always behavioral change expected at the individual level. So I think that is my last slide. Yeah, these are the publications you can consult where all the information is. So thank you very much. I hope I was on time. I, practiced a lot to be on time, but it's very short. Thank you, back to you, Ulf, or to the moderators. Back to us, yes. Thank you, Kuhn. And uh, we do have a couple of minutes for questions, so I encourage people in the audience to send in their question in the Q&A window, please. Uh, but otherwise, I can start with one. So in your presentation, you highlight the importance of context, so the peculiar circumstances around individuals and how they have a big impact on how people will act. Um, but I was wondering, are there any general principles we can draw? So are there any common issues that you have seen across different settings that influence the way people use antibiotics? 
Um, I'd like to answer this with, with um, two, two parts. Maybe yeah, there are potentially common factors, especially if you look at, at specific regions, like um, there might be economic motives not to buy full course treatments or not to go um, to the hospital, for example, or you might complain that most interventions are top-down interventions or that we always responsible as the end user, etc. But my real answer to a question about this is that I think most of the time what happens too much is that we try to have generalizable or standardized approaches that supposed to work across different contexts. And I'd like to answer in that sense with the recommendation not to look too much for this cross-cultural or cross-context comparison and not too much for these, what we know in the medical field for other programs as well, are these standardized one size fits all um, magical bullet solutions. So more importantly than what is beyond the different contexts, I think is embedding the interventions in specific contexts. Thank you. Thank you. And there is a question from the audience. So Aaron Zink, I hope I pronounced your name correctly, um, is asking whether you found any organizations or initiatives that are um, execute or um, taking cultural approaches to tackling AMR. Yes, um, I think I want to answer this a bit in two ways as well. First of all, what I'm trying to say here is not just that the cultural is ignored, for example. That there are organizations that will look at culture. For example, like the example I gave, people associate different symptoms with different diseases. So you can have cultural approaches, and there are quite, especially NGOs, etc., that try to take these things into account. But I think when we look at people's individual culture, we try to match that to the culture. That is one thing, and it's very necessary. And we all know if you carry out interventions that are not aligned with the social cultural context, they will not work. But I want to also want to emphasize that beyond these individuals that act in this culture, there might be other organizations, there might be policies, there might be interventions that we can set up in such a way that they change more the system than the individual that um, in his or her own culture then tries to make a change. Thank you, Kuhn, and thanks a lot for joining us today. Thank you. And now we are going to welcome back the panel, our panelists for today, Claire, Tracy, and Sujit. They're here with us. Uh, I want to remind you all that you can write questions also for our panelists in the Q&A um, section of the webinar. So you are welcome to write your questions there, and we will try to take up as many as possible during this panel of discussion. Um, this seminar or this webinar is actually called Turning Plans into Action. This is because many times the recommendations coming up from fora like the Uppsala Health Summit sound really good in practice, but are perhaps a little bit more difficult to implement as sound very good in theory, but it's very difficult to put them into practice, especially when we have in account the socioeconomic differences around the world. I want to ask you three, Tracy, Claire and Sujit, in your corner of the world, um, what is really stopping these recommendations from becoming a reality? Um, perhaps can we start with Claire and then we move through the panel? Thanks very much. And can I first say thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this panel, um, which comes after that amazing um, summit that you had. And there's a fantastic report online as well that you've written about the summit, which, you know, brings together the different um, recommendations for behavioural change. And I think that, you know, that's really, really useful reading for people um, to follow up with. And it's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you, too, for, to Kuhn for an amazing presentation. I thought that was really, really um, insightful and um, you know I, uh, you preempted some of the things that I would say in uh, in answer to the questions that were being uh, were being given um, but of course you know when you ask the question if we look at those social socioeconomic differences across the world um, what stops some of the recommendations that are made about antimicrobial resistance and 
um, you know, and behavior change from being implemented? I think, um, you know, the answer is embedded in the question in different places, the reasons that we end up having antibiotics used in the way that they are, the reasons that we've got AMR in the way that it is, is actually really quite different. If you compare a place where um, there's been a very um, successful commercial marketplace for antibiotics in the informal sector for a long time with a place where it's primarily a public sector driven scenario, you're going to have very, very different reasons that people are using um, antibiotics um, and therefore um, the reasons that those off the shelf methodologies aren't working are going to be different in those places. And of course, then you start to think, is an off the shelf methodology really the most important, you know, the best way to address this? And I would um, suggest that some of the really useful things that we can see off the shelf um, and that have been coming out recently, I don't know if people have seen the TAP um, from, from WHO, um, the TAP uh, methodology that they've developed. I think taking the kinds of approaches where you're trying to do formative research to understand the current, current particular context is the best way to then you know, develop the strategies that might be appropriate in a particular place rather than expecting a particular way of working uh, to work in across lots of different places. So I think the steps of how, you know, the process steps are very useful to have off the shelf, but the actual, you know, how to change things, I think has to be developed locally. Uh, very nice. Thank you, Claire. Uh, Tracy, what about you? Um, yeah, hi, everybody. And uh, yes, uh, thank you for having me on board. Um, so what is stopping these recommendations from becoming a reality? In my setting, really, um, just like what we've seen in Cambodia, it's a myriad of competing priorities. Um, some more urgent than others, or maybe perceived as more urgent than others. So for example, um, if we were to look at, uh, say, addressing uh, you know, um, public health issues, and let me zone into antimicrobial resistance within um, uh, the education sector, for example. So will the Ministry of Education in the African, you know, remote and rural areas prioritize allocating the budget towards school feeding pro programs um, or provision of sanitary towels for um, uh, for um, vulnerable girls in the in the socially disadvantaged groups or incorporating MR into the curriculum which will actually require spending money to train the teachers um, might call for abandoning existing textbooks uh, you know in the current curricula so that you know the, the updated ones are the ones are, are brought on board, not forgetting that this AMR, um, as it stands, is still quite um, a phenomenon that's not un well understood amongst not only policymakers, but even just the, the, the population by and large. So I, I believe this is what really stops great recommendations such as those that came out of um, the, the conference that was held earlier this year and the report that followed from actually becoming a reality. Yeah, thank you. Very well said, Tracy. Uh, Sujit, what about your, your area and your context? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for inviting me to be part of this panel and um, also for that wonderful report. I think uh, there's a lot of effort in it. It's very comprehensive. And um, I, can, I can see a lot of sweat and blood in that report. And I, I truly believe that such reports are important. and it's probably important that different corners of the world actually take snippets of what they think would be useful and then translate it into action. But what prevents that action often is the question passed on to me. So I think one of the things that we re have to realize, and by the way, I'm, I'm working in India, um, where you know I can't say that I represent India because there are private and uh, government hospital facilities there are uh, places where uh, rural, very remote, uh, with hardly any facilities. There are places which are um, urban, with you know more than 300 hospitals or 300 pharmacy shops. So it, there is a even within a country or within a region or within a state, there's all kinds of um, a, a variety of healthcare available. And so I have to be careful in what I say. But overall, I, I think one of the biggest problems has been. Uh, how people understand health. And that 
based on culture, based on religion, based on individual upbringing, based on circumstance, um, vary so widely that whatever we put on the plate in terms of a report or a policy uh, can be interpreted in various ways, both from a positive and negative um, point of view. The second point I would like to say that is habit and health seeking behavior um, is, is again, um, we all have a, a need to get well. And how we achieve that is probably in different ways. Uh, so, for example, um, we have, I mean, we've had various situations in, in many places in India where uh, they just don't go to the doctor. Now, you may ask why. Well, first of all, there has to be a doctor available. But the second is it could be expensive. The third is that you may have to wait more than three, four hours. Fourth is you may have 300 outpatients cramming uh, to see one doctor within three hours. So you get only 20 seconds. So they, they just try and go and get a medicine, which could be less expensive. They could probably spend a little more time with the, with the pharmacist or whoever is there. So those kind of, um, and then of course, uh, if the doctor actually uh, you know, says you need a lab test, that's more money. And you could probably have the same um, uh, you know, drug uh, with less cost. So all these kinds of uh, behaviors and circumstances and individual decisions are very difficult to uh, predict uh, in, a, in a very broad setting. And uh, therefore we, we have to, that's probably one of the biggest reasons why many of these models uh, can work, but only to a certain extent. And the last point I would like to make is the situation around, and we know from the lower middle income country settings and not even in LMICs, even beyond actually, um, it, that infrastructure and personal are extremely important from a healthcare facility and healthcare point of view. So we, we have many facilities where the, probably the doctor comes only once a week. You could even have the opposite where there's so much choice, you don't know which doctor to go to. And as uh, one was saying about commercial versus capacity doctors with or without labs. And therefore um, many of these places are often in uh, places that are 20 kilometers away. And uh, people just cannot reach them because of lack of uh, a vehicle or walking, you're too sick to walk. So these are kind of, uh, I would, I would in summarize and say that basically, whether it's the overall understanding or it's the health seeking behavior or it's the uh, infrastructure. One thing which often uh, sort of prevents things is people are not able to understand what is right and what is wrong. And uh, you, uh, you might say, are you sure about this? Because there is a conscience. But the fact is that with illiteracy, with cultures, beliefs, and practices, things get very muddled into a gray zone. So I'll give you a simple example and stop. When I'm on the road in a traffic, um, I've often seen people overtaking on the left and right. And I've always been cross with them saying, why are you doing things which are wrong? But they start arguing with me because they don't know it's wrong. They see an open space and they move their two wheeler into that space. And for them, that is right. And similarly, at a crossroads, who has the right of way? Culturally or law wise, probably the, the, uh, there's an order in that. But actually, in many of our settings, the biggest vehicle has the right of way. So I think there are a lot of things which we can take from the report, but we'll have to be very careful how we translate it into action because some of these factors which I said really come into play. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sujit. Uh, like one of our audience members is also pointing out in low and middle income countries in poor conditions, there's also a low percentage of immunization and also low practices in infection prevention and control, which also affect the AMR problem, right? So that's a very good point by one of our members. Um, yeah. Yeah, so it's clear we have a lot to learn from um, coming together of social scientists and healthcare professionals. But uh, I was wondering, Claire, uh, in your experience as an anthropologist, uh, what do you think are the limits of behavioral science when it comes to tackling AMR? Because obviously, a lot of the focus at the summit has been on how um, behavioral science can help us uh, tackle the problem. Uh, but do you see other social sciences important there as well? Thanks very much. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I think Kuhn has done a really nice job, actually, of already highlighting some of the, um, both the benefits of a behavioural approach, um, but also the limitations. Because I think in his um, presentation, he's drawn attention to the fact that there is only so much we can ask of people, whether it's a patient or a pharmacist or a prescriber, there's only so much they can do within the parameters that they're working. Um, and so there will inevitably be a limit to the amount of antibiotic usage change that we can achieve through asking people to do something different, whether we change their beliefs or their, you know, to, to change their practices, however that's, uh, you know, done. But there's only so much that um, we can ask people to do by changing how they're thinking about things. Um, and I think in current and Kuhn's examples, he was also showing, you know, the ways that there are structural factors that could be addressed that would then allow people to practice differently. Um, but I think moreover than this, there is a potential for us to think beyond behaviour, not only saying there's a reason that somebody's doing this and there are reasons around that, why that individual is doing it, but also to decenter human behaviour from the antibiotic usage problem. And that would mean saying, okay, if we're seeing a rise in antibiotic use, yes, there are people using it, but actually what other trends is that connecting to? What other issues um, is that relating to? What other ways of us living is that relating to? So um, we know that um, when, uh, we, when we see antibiotic use increase, for example, with farming, um, we know that that's partly because people are trying to protect their investments. They're trying to use antibiotics in order to protect their um, flock of poultry, for example, or their pigs. Um, and they're trying to in protect their investments by maximizing the amount um, of meat that they're going to produce. So that there is a, um, and they're trying to, you know, tackle the hygiene environment uh, in the kinds of ways that they're doing their, their farming. Um, in a situation where perhaps they don't have any other kinds of um, insurance or safety net around losing all of those animals. Or, um, so, so their investment is at, at high risk. So they're living, they're sort of, their livelihood is right on a knife's edge and antibiotics help to, to push that into a particular direction. You can ask those people to change their practices, but ultimately there are other things around that um, that, that ch change their practices. But if we decenter behavior, we also then see this drive for protein globally, this drive for development through protein production, which needs to be addressed. And that's an issue of different sectors having different priorities that are in tension to each other. That's about different versions of development that are coming into tension. Um, and it's about having to then have difficult political decisions about what gets prioritized. Um, so there, you know, is, is an example of decentering behavior. You could say the same thing around why people are um, ending up using antibiotics as a quick fix for hygiene problems. Actually, this is an issue of, do we have enough support in our health system for people to have the luxury of not using antibiotics? So that means we have to do something different about our health system, simply policing people won't fix that problem. So I think sort of thinking about how we can decenter the, the behavioral aspect requires various other skill sets that um, different social scientists can bring on board. Thank you so much, Claire. Tracy, I have a question for you. You mentioned on your previous intervention how important education is and how the lack of education about AMR can also be stopping the proper use of antibiotics in cert certain contexts. I know that you have been working really hard on implementing educational programs on AMR in Kenya. And I would like to ask you, what have you learned from that experience and what would your recommendations be for people that want to implement similar um, uh, actions in their schools? Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, great question. Um, I think in a nutshell, there needs to be a disruption of the, you know, usual broader learning-based sort of formal education systems that we have in place if we are to address, uh, I dare say, a complex um, issue that sort of penetrates um, each and every sector we know, um, such as AMR, um, it's a, I think it's the only way that we can really uh, effectively address AMR amongst our children and 
and then theirs will be a generation that is well equipped with uh, the skills to translate and transform the knowledge that they gain into actionable and pragmatic interventions according to the environment in which they live in, right? Um, also, it is really pertinent to engage the relevant stakeholders right from the beginning of um, such an intervention. And by this, I actually mean, you know, the different stakeholders from right from the different ministries uh, of health, public health, education, um, key opinion leaders within the communities, the children themselves, um, and not also just you know the implementing teachers but um the, the administration uh, itself as well and this will definitely bring about the ownership and sustainability bit of it um what i've also seen really working in our setup is that child to child approach um because it does boost confidence amongst these children they are able to you know understand this problem that they're being given and engage amongst themselves and then come up with homegrown pragmatic solutions in their own world, not being told what to do by the grown up in their setup, right? So, um, and then because they're able to, to use even just um, a, a problem solving mode that um, uses locally available materials such as what they're taught let's say in home home economics like uh, building little kitchen gardens then they're able to actually enjoy it and as well learn from it and understand how it connects to their health you know poor nutrition leads to increased use of antibiotics um which then leads to the um ineffective antibiotics as they are being taught by the teachers back at school it's also actually quite important to um, boost the teacher's confidence. I think we assume that, you know, this is a teacher, they should be able to understand what this mouthful of a word, antimicrobial resistance is. So um, it means that first, let's avoid when we're approaching the teachers, you know, as the implementing partners that we need to engage, we need to avoid a sort of, um, you know, threat messages and, and, and if I dare say apocalyptic messages, yeah? And sort of uh, putting AMR as such a future um, pandemic per se, right? Because uh, it will only just cause fear and even dilute the, 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 the need for the immediate um, and um, important response that we need to an ongoing threat right now, which is AMR. So for example, they might be aware of COVID, but they're not aware of AMR. So we need to find, applicable terms, if AMR really cannot register in their brains, uh, then why not use simple terms that they understand, superbugs, or whatever other word is used um, in their local setup, or relate it to a disease that they may be aware of, that the, the, the medicines are not working or have been changed. I like using the case um, malaria, for example, in our setup. When we were children, we were using quinine-based medicines. Now we've gone up to using um, atimitha based ones, and we've gone through a number of chemicals. So why? Then you need to show why this happens and hence um, foster the understanding of AMR. And really, I think that that is the only way that everyone will understand the role that um, theirs plays in addressing AMR and come together even from the different subjects, whether it's home economics, even engineering, because they understand that messing up the environment then messes up everything else and we get sick and we use more antibiotics. And then as they grow on to become future leaders, they understand how each and every of their role is important in addressing antimicrobial resistance. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. That's really inspiring. And now, Sujit, over to you. Let's talk money for a little bit. <laughs> so one of the problems with AMR is that there are widespread financial incentives that push people into the wrong behaviors, basically. So because of these incentives, because of widespread corruption sometimes, unfortunately. Doctors are pushed into over-prescribing antibiotics. Pharmacists perhaps end up 
over dispensing them, even without a prescription. Uh, and farmers use them as growth promoters, even when they shouldn't. So these um, roadblocks may seem insurmountable. How do you even begin to battle corruption, right? But do you think, um, are there any small steps we can take to start tackling these obstacles? Thank you. Uh, I think you've given me a very tough question. <laughs> Money uh, makes the world go round. Uh, I do wish that it was love which makes the world go round, and, uh, and I still aspire for that. Uh, I'll give you, a, uh, before I go into the antibiotics thing, I, I, I saw a documentary uh, report today, um, and this brings this whole issue of um, different methodologies to achieve the same goal. We all know we're in a pandemic now, and and of course, there was been lockdowns, but there's always been this great debate between lockdown versus livelihood. And it came to a, a real fruition in my mind uh, with ex an example of two girls. One was from an urban setup, middle class family, and one was a, a, a girl, uh, same age, uh, probably both were around eight or nine years old, uh, from a rural background, ex extremely poor family. Both were under lockdown. Uh, but the, the, the urban girl actually was able to continue studying because of um, online classes. And she had a, a, a tablet with her, mother was with her, uh, so she could uh, you know, sort out any doubts, et cetera. Whereas the uh, poor rural girl did not have a tablet, uh, did not um, have anybody to help her, uh, could not go to school, and uh, she was stuck. There's no electricity. Now, both the schools have opened, and here you have the uh, urban girl actually um, just smoothly going back into the physical school, but the rural girl, even the most elementary alphabets, she's not able to write down anymore. In one and a half years, she's uh, lost it. So if you translate that into the AMR antibiotic world, I, I think there's an issue of many of the policies, we know where we're want, wanting to head. Um, and it's the methodology and the context and the circumstance which sometimes prevents us from having success in that particular area. It's just the lockdown versus the livelihood kind of approach. And why I say that is if you look at some of the biggest problems in terms of money uh, relating to antibiotics, we do have to remember there is always this um, diversity of access versus excess. There's an issue of excess antibiotics and use and inappropriate use, but there is also an issue of access. So if you look at it from a deficient money point of view, access, uh, for example, affordability is a big problem when pocket of out-of-pocket expenditure is 80% in, in certain countries. And so is availability. Most of our primary health care centers um, stock cotrimoxazole, which we know is you know, uh, ineffective for many uh, organisms. And, um, we, and they probably have just a little bit of amoxicillin and a few other antibiotics, but definitely not the critical antibiotics we have so many policies for. Uh, and uh, therefore, you know, money versus uh, and availability is a huge issue. So they are forced to go and spend money in, in private pharmacy shops. On the other hand, you have excess, and there also money plays a part. Competition between pharmacy shops, between doctors, incentives, whether you can call it negative incentive or positive incentive. I mean, you know how, how rampant it is. Um, there's also an issue of time because time means money. So you and I probably could take a sick leave and uh, survive our job. Uh, but if, if a daily wage laborer uh, has to wait in an outpatient department uh, just for a test and an antibiotic, they are losing money. And then last but not the least, uh, we have to realize that any sickness um, involves a lack of work in many, many situations. So the money part is not just about the issue of uh, um, antibodies costing money, but it is also about the overall circumstances. So whenever we are moving to behavioral change, the holistic view of money needs to be um, you know, pushed and, and, and be thought about. Please also remember that many of the private hospitals, 25% of the budget is antibiotic sales. So if we are trying to go for stewardship and we try and put our big policies in, sometimes it just might not work, especially in private hospitals where they want that 25% for whatever purposes they need. And, and similarly, if you've got to understand that as uh, ineffectiveness it's, uh, you know, rises and resistance rises, we're going to more and more critical antibiotic, which is beyond the reach of the common man, pushing them into catastrophic burdens. I once did a study where I showed that um, you know, if you're resistant, it's basically we're talking about at least 
300 to 350 days worth of daily wages in some cases. Now, in the patients, though, and not in patients, sorry, in the um, other sectors, growth promoters uh, is widely used, uh, not just growth promoters, but also um, simple things like, um, you know, just to prevent an infection. That's because there are the viable alternatives to small scale farmers has not been thought about enough. So the business model needs to be innovative and inventive. Let me end by saying what I think are the small steps. I think awareness that there is a problem is number one. Second, understanding of why there is a problem. Third, knowledge about what can be done. And I'm talking about individuals and, and communities. Fourth, action about how to best tackle it in the local context with constraints. And, but overall, I think it's very important that sustainable development, universal health care, and health system strengthening are built into the system. And I know it's easy to say this, but difficult to do in LMICs. But unless we move that way, no matter what kind of models we try to implement, the money will matter at the end. But one thing overrides money, and that's why I started with money go, makes the world go around, but love. An emotional connect to individuals, stories that pierce the heart and make one say, hey, that can happen to me. I better try and change myself. That is one thing which can override money, in my opinion. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Srijit. Uh, we, uh, you actually answered one of the questions that we had from one of the persons in the audience, which was asking, uh, Sabrina was asking if affordability and accessibility are also factors to combating AMR, and you were very clearly pointing out to those as well. Uh, we have another question from our audience uh, that we would like to see if any of you, uh, Sujit, Claire, or Tracy, want to comment on it. If uh, antibiotic stewardship can change uh, the antibiotic prescription patterns of local practitioners towards giving antibiotics, is this a feasible action that can be taken? Uh, Sujito, Tracy, or Claire, if you want to comment on it. I, I, can, I can start off. Um, so I, I think uh, we do definitely do need to have that on board. Um, but I think there is a clear differentiation between host hospital stewardship and uh, community stewardship. The second aspect is um, the kind of stewardship plans which have been we started started with often fit the model of tertiary care hospitals with good labs, et cetera. We do need to step down, if I can put it that way, to what are the circumstances in a secondary care hospital and also a primary health care hospital and be innovative enough, understanding the behavioral issues in these different levels of hospitals and of course other sectors which are not in human health. I, I must also say that ultimately though, we've got to remember that we can do only so much with uh, a stewardship by itself. We've got to make sure that there are champions who are able to advocate that stewardship within each healthcare facility. And secondly, get the leaders on board. Uh, if you're not able to do that and have a critical mass of people to sustain it, often it collapses within a few months or a, uh, or a, or a year and the enthusiasm remarkably dies down. Thank you. Thank you, Sujit. Tracy and Claire, I don't know if you had any comments on that, but I was actually wondering if we could take the question into a slightly different perspective. Since Sujit, you mentioned getting political powers on board, and I, I was wondering, how do we do that? How do we get political leadership on board so we can address those structural issues? Claire and Tracy, if you have any comments about that, that would be great. Um, okay, how do we get our political leaders on board? Um, simple, but not easy, <laughs> meaning <laughs> we just need to simplify the scientific jargon that at times we so easily put out there in terms of data and everything. Yes, the data is needed. It is necessary for sure. But if we are approaching the political um, players, then we need to um, simplify the message that we're bringing on board. And that's why I'm saying it's simple, but it's not easy. Because at the same time, as I mentioned before, um, especially in our LMIC setups, there's so many competing priorities. So yes, they might understand what I'm talking about. They might understand about you know, the urgency of the matter, but really what will they address and what will they not 
address, right? Um, so at times it even means that we have to unfortunately take on the emotive side of things. Um, COVID has prevented a very, or rather presented us with a very good example, for example, um, where now everyone understands in our generation that is what a pandemic is actually capable of. It disrupts the very being of any human being out there. I mean, people have lost jobs, um, schools have been closed, which have ended up in, um, especially in our setup, for example, in the, in the, in the, um, what do you call the urban slum area, especially, uh, we've had many uh, sexual gender-based violence that have also resulted in unwanted pregnancies among our, our, our little girls and um, even forced marriages, breaking down a whole society. So at times I think you need to uh, just really present from a an emotive part where they understand, they can see what has happened because of a similar thing. And at the same time, also just sim really simplify the language from um, not just presenting medical and scientific jargon, but to the, um, the real nature of things on ground. Over, maybe Claire? Thanks, Tracy. And just, um, I think you put that incredibly well. Um, and, you know, the number of competing priorities that are equally as huge and as important um, as we know that antimicrobial resistance is right now, not just in the future. And antimicrobial resistance, you know, has a has lots of terrible stories attached to it too already today. Um, but I think one of the ways in which we need to think about building an evidence base um, is to have an evidence base that demonstrates the impact of things that can address AMR, but can also address other issues. And I know that, I think it was one of the first talks in the Uppsala Summit was done by um, Dr. Frank Beth, and he was talking about the World Bank's perspective on AMR as a development issue. And um, they've put forward the argument for having AMR smart interventions. And I think we need to really think carefully about how one, and this sort of speaks a little bit to Sabiha's question, in the, in the question box as well, that how do we build an evidence base that tells us what the, what the impacts are of the kinds of interventions that might impact AMR and other things. If we think of it as a development problem, there are, there are, it's not just interventions that will impact AMR, these are interventions that have multiple impacts and multiple um, you know, ways of working. They can be expensive, but they can solve a number of different problems. And, they also, you know, if you've got things aligned in that way, when we are now looking at even more budgetary constraint post COVID um, and, you know, difficulties and where should we spend our funding, looking at some of the reasons that people are getting infectious diseases in the first place. I mean, you were talking as well about urban informal settlement scenarios where, where infectious diseases are so common, um, but many, many other things are so common. Looking at the ways in which we can improve those housing situations, we can improve the water situations. Um, those kinds of interventions can have multiple impacts, including on AMR. And I think if we step back a bit, we'll look at and realize that if you can address infectious diseases, you will reduce enormously the proportion of people who are able to get AMR. Um, so, you know, those very, very large numbers that we've got um, currently uh, estimated of AMR at the moment would shrink if we can address the, and the prevention of infectious disease, which is a lot of the methods to do that are the same as preventing other things. So I think it's kind of joining things up. Um, and, and I would suggest not having AMR compete um, on the global stage with other things, but it needs to join together. That was great. Thank you so much for all your uh, contributions. Unfortunately, we don't have time for more. I believe some of the questions have been answered by typing by some of the panelists, which is great. Thank you so much for helping us with uh, getting all the questions on board. And now uh, we're about to wrap up. So I want to well say thank you to you, thank Federica, you. <laughs> for being here with me as well. It was great to be moderating this. And we send over the word to Ulf, who is going to close up this and really wrap it up for real this time. Sad, but but true and hopefully we'll see some changes happening in the, in the next uh, few years mm -hmm. we hope so thanks again thank you thank you so much both of you and to Sujit, tracy and claire thank you so much for sharing all this wisdom it's it's a very nice format to be kind of say 
peer reviewed live like this. I, I think it was a, it's a very, very nice format of, of conversations. So uh, thank you so much. And I will not try to, to conclude something like that. that. That would be just ridiculous. But what, what I want to do is to encourage all of you to, let's see, download our post-conference report. And it's built like, um, like uh, several policy briefs. You can download it on the internet and then it's, it's a set of, of policy briefs. So you can really use this uh, in, in a way that um, you really turn plans into actions in your different parts of, world, of the world and, and different contexts. And, and so, so um, with this encouragement, I uh, thank you all and uh, saying bye-bye from the Uppsala Health Summit team. Thank you, bye-bye.